I just think Bryce is probably the safest among the bunch and, and probably has the best surroundings for long-term success at the position. Welcome into BBM Sports Insiders. He is former Alabama national champion QB and of course ESPN's college football analyst. We are so excited to have Greg McElroy. You know me, I'm Aaron Coscarelli and Greg, first and foremost, how are you doing today? Excellent, Aaron. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's uh, it's fun to be with you and, and it's fun to cover the draft from an analyst. I'm kind of wearing the analyst hat while also being a fan. The NFL, I'm a fan. I'm a Cowboy fan. And have since become a Jets fan since they drafted me in 11. So like I I love the NFL draft because it's kind of the colliding of worlds, like business and fandom all colliding under one roof. So I, I love the draft and love kind of hitting it from all the angles. Well, keep that analyst hat on because I do want to start with the NFL draft. And for the very first time, which is actually quite shocking, in the common draft era, an Alabama player was selected number one overall, QB Bryce Young. He now is officially a Carolina Panther. How do you see that fit for him, especially with new head coach Frank Reich and the team around him? Well, let's start with the Alabama angle for a moment. Uh, you said it correctly, modern day NFL draft, which that's what I observe as the NFL draft, because frankly, drafts that took place in the 40s to me don't necessarily move the needle. Uh, but it, it's wild to me because Harry Gilmer went first overall in 48. So depending on what generation of Bama fan you're talking about, this has been a massive debate in the last week. <laughs> People are like, how can you forget Harry Gilmer? It's like, I could, I was born in 88. So that was 40 years prior to me even being alive. But, um, I think it's amazing. I, I love Bryce. I love his story. Um, I also love the prospect and it's kind of rare to both love the person and the player all at once. So you can watch the player and sometimes watch with a critical eye. There's very little to dislike about his game. But what's also interesting is, is you get to know him and what makes him tick so much, Aaron. And I know you know this and anyone that's covered the draft. I don't feel like we lean enough on college analysts sometimes when evaluating prospects because we really get to know the person. We get to tell their stories at the college level. We meet them at 17 years old in some cases, 16 years old at other times. And we kind of follow the maturation process of the player. And Bryce Young, from the second he stepped on the field at Alabama in 2020, he you could just tell there was something different about the guy. Edge, chip on the shoulder, tremendous work ethic, a guy that studied like crazy, that had great instincts, but also never snapped the football without answers to the test. And oftentimes in college, if you're thinking about being drafted in the top five, top 10, you can just out athlete pretty much everybody you play against. You're just, you're the best player on the field and you're going to be able to beat them. But Bryce didn't always beat them with his athleticism. He beat them by being a cerebral student of the game. And that's what I think is going to translate most beautifully for him as he transitions, because if they run, for instance, an overload blitz, or if he knows his protection might be weak with a certain defender that's coming, he already sees it and he knows where his answers are. So while people have knocked him for his lack of just sheer physical size and durability, he doesn't get hit very hard because he always knows where that pressure is coming from and he knows where the outlets are built in within the offensive system. So uh, I think he's a great prospect and he's a great person and uh, is going to translate beautifully into what I think is an incredible situation in Carolina with all the great quarterback minds they have on that staff. Well, you took the question I had that was next right out uh, for me, which the big knock is his size, right? He's uh, he's 5'10". That's well documented. Uh, keep in mind, Kyler Murray also under six feet. So you, you and everyone else should not be, and other Carolina fans should not be concerned with regards to his height. No, but let's think about Kyler Murray as a comp. Think about how Bryce played the game where he's 
throwing it on time, where he's getting the ball out on time, where he understands, hey, pressure's coming, I got to get rid of it. Kyler Murray wants to run around, create, and run around you. So he was prototypical of a guy that's going to out-athlete you by being the best athlete in the field. And he has, at times, looked sensational in the NFL, and at other times, looked completely lost. So I think Bryce Young's very different in that regard. While similar in, in height, I do think that there's a certain level of maturity where Bryce knows that because of his size, he is susceptible. And because of the way he plays the game, if he doesn't have answers to the test before he snaps the football, he, he runs the risk of potentially putting his body in harm's way. So I think while similar in size, while similar in stature, they are very different players with how they approach the game. And I actually think Bryce will step right into a starting role at Carolina and probably have immediate success because of how he's studied and how he's prepared the last several years to approach each and every game that he played for the Crimson Tide. Yeah, and that's an interesting take from you because like you said earlier, as an ESPN college analyst, you may have your finger on the pulse a little bit better uh, than the guys who are covering, you know, specifically the pros. So it's a it's an interesting take uh, with regards to your thoughts on his maturity. Well, now with regards to his maturity, you have a very mature QB already on the roster in a guy like Andy Dalton. What can people expect to see from the rookie? Are they going to bring him along slowly? Do you see Andy starting? Do you see Bryce starting right away? How do you see this playing out? I think, I think it's a little bit circumstantial. I, I've known Andy since I was 16 years old and we played each other in the state championship game in high school. Uh, so we go way back. Uh, we were on the same senior bowl team. We played together in Cincinnati for a year in 2013. So I've, I've been around Andy for a, a long time and, and love uh, so much that, that one, he's continuing to play the game going on year 13, uh, has had a tremendous career up to this point and is still a very capable starter in, in the NFL. Now, is he going to ultimately at this stage of his career win you a Super Bowl? Probably not, not without some ridiculous season, which he goes on an absolute tear. That's probably not going to happen. But Andy is not a guy that has a huge ego. Andy is one of those guys that wants, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. That's his mindset. He is selfless. And I know that he'll be the ultimate professional in helping teach Bryce how to become a pro a, a pros pro right and and andy's been that way whether it be as a starter or a backup at every stage of his career so i i am really really happy that bryce is going into a situation where he's going to have a mentor that understands what it's like to step in as a rookie and start on a team that was going to immediately be in playoff contention which i think carolina given the state of the division uh, very much going to be in, in the mix there, <laughs> you know, a team that might be, you know, seven and 10 might make the playoffs out of the, out of the NFC South this year. So uh, I think Andy's would it surprise me if Andy's the starter day one, not at all, but it would surprise me that if he didn't give way at some point to Bryce immediately in the future, knowing that Bryce is prepared, I think because of the offense he ran under Bill O'Brien, who's now back in the NFL as the offensive coordinator for the New England Patriots, he ran an NFL system that requires and puts a lot on his shoulders in the pre-snap to set protections, to give freedom with how you want to signal routes, or if you see something, you can check to this. If you see that coverage, you can go to this. That offense is designed to give the quarterback answers, and more often than not, Bryce, Bryce had the correct answer uh, every single time he snapped the ball. So uh, I think Andy could very well start the season as the starter. I wouldn't be surprised if he did, but at the same time, I mean, this is Bryce's franchise and I think they'll probably give him the keys to the car sooner than you might think. You're right. Definitely an interesting take right there. Uh, let's play a, a game, a rapid fire game. I'm going to give you a name of the other quarterbacks selected at the top of the draft. And you tell me what kind of fit you see this QB playing with their respective NFL team. Ohio State CJ Stroud, he was selected number two overall by the Texans. I love CJ Stroud as a thrower. And I had questions about CJ Stroud, about whether or not he can improvise, whether he can make off schedule plays. Oftentimes his receivers had such massive separation 
that it didn't require insane pinpoint accuracy because the receivers were so wide open. But I all kind of, I kind of came 180 in my evaluation of him as a prospect when watching the Georgia game in person, we actually called that game on the radio. So watch that game in person to see how he moved effortlessly in the pocket while still keeping his eyes downfield, how he threw guys open, how he anticipated throws, how the pocket wasn't, didn't always have great integrity and he had to move and, and adjust and make those crazy chaotic plays. So that game in and of itself completely changed my opinion of him as a prospect because so often in the NFL, you're not throwing from a clean pocket. And almost every time he dropped back at Ohio State, he was throwing from a clean pocket. So uh, it showed to me that he could do that. And I think he steps into a situation that is advantageous. You get a new coach, uh, a guy that I know well, and D'Amico Ryans, who I think is going to understand how to bring him along. Not that he's going to be super hands-on with the starting quarterback, but I do think that it was the right move to take him at two. If you have your guy at number two, don't trade that pick in favor of maybe getting more down the road. Take the guy that might lead you into the future. So I was glad to see him come off the board where he did. Florida's Anthony Richardson goes to the Colts at four overall. Highest ceiling in the draft. Uh, I don't know if I want to say of any position, but probably pretty close to it. Uh, there are not a lot of guys that are blessed with the physical gifts that he's blessed with he is very fleet of foot we called two of his games last year one against kentucky and he looked god awful he was awful absolutely awful in that game and then one against lsu where he was pretty good uh didn't win the game ultimately but but did some nice things in that game that that kind of showcased his athleticism he's really accurate uh but he does occasionally force the ball uh, he can push the ball down the field with a big arm, but does occasionally throw it a little bit too far. I think he's got decent touch, but he's a guy that just needs reps. He has not started a ton of games, but if you're going to bank on upside in this draft, he is without question the guy that you want under center for the near future. So I, I think in a, in a perfect world, he'd get a redshirt year, but also at the same time, like I said, man, he's a guy that just needs to play because he has not played a ton up to this point and playing a whole bunch of football between now and when his contract's up in three or four in four years before the option uh, would give you the best assessment of what he ultimately might be long term. So uh, I'd love for him to redshirt. I think it'd be great for him, but uh, I think throwing him out there into the fire might give you a better sense of of where he ultimately might get to. Uh, Will Levis out of Kentucky, surprisingly, he fell uh, to the top of the second uh, round. He went to the Titans. Your thoughts on him? It wasn't crazy surprising to me. I, I thought that you listened to some of the, the draft analysts and what they were saying about Will Levis being top five, you know, oh, he might even go in the top two. It's like, I, I just didn't see it. I, if you watch his tape from two years ago, when he had a really nice year in 2021, it didn't warrant a selection in the top five, top 10. Now, is the upside there? Maybe, but not like Richardson. I mean, not even close as far as the upside is concerned. Now, he's got naturally strong arm. Uh, he, I think, has enough mobility to be able to use his legs in need of a jam. But he doesn't, he has a lot of misses. There's a lot of misses. When he throws the ball, he misses a lot. More so than you would ever see from a guy that's going to come off the board in the top five, 10, 15, whatever pick he ended up coming off. So I thought second round was appropriate. I was a little surprised he felt that far, but I thought the twenties would be about right for, for Will Levis because the team would hop in and maybe try to get that fifth year option for him, knowing that that would be advantageous and, and cap friendly for the teams, but a uh, good player, but really needs to hone things in a little bit. needs to get a little more flexible. Uh, and I also think too, from a decision-making standpoint, he needs to be a little bit better there. It takes a lot of hits. Doesn't need to be taking the same hits that he took at times in college. People will say, well, you know, it's Kentucky. The offensive line didn't play very well. No, they weren't very good last year. And the run game wasn't very good last year. But Will Levis did have excellent wide receivers on the perimeter. People wouldn't necessarily look at the wide receivers at Kentucky traditionally and say that's a difference making group. That group last year, pretty dang talented. And the year before that, Wandale Robinson was on the team, pretty dang talented. So he's had guys around him in the past, but it just, it's been really inconsistent. So there are bright spots and there are very, very scary spots from a coach's standpoint, from an analyst standpoint, but 
I think he went to a good situation, assuming they still have a couple more good years with Derrick Henry, and they're still going to try to lean on running the football and probably work him into the mix at some point in the next year or two. And in that situation, don't forget, they do have QB Malik Willis, who they get, who they got last year in the third round. So uh, it'll be interesting how things, of course, pan out in Tennessee. But big picture wise, of course, of all of the top rookie QBs, who do you project five years from now having the most success? And also, of course, keep in mind, not just the talent at the QB, but the respective team and system and situation they're going to. So who of these matches do you believe in five years has the most success? I think the best situation for quarterback developments in Carolina. I mean, starting with the head coach, OC, quarterback coach. I mean, everybody with tremendous pedigree, of having either played or been around or understanding what it takes to develop a young quarterback from scratch. So I, and I also coupled that the situation, ownership, everyone else that's kind of in line, it feels like it does feel like there's alignment in Carolina with what they ultimately want to become. You look at where Bryce is at and, and how far along he already is. I think, like I talked about earlier, I think he already has played like a pro in college. So I can see that being a slightly easier transition for him than maybe for the aforementioned three being Levis, Anthony Richardson, and CJ Stroud, all of which are very talented guys. I just think Bryce is probably the safest among the bunch and and probably has the best surroundings for long-term success at the position. And uh, we'll have our producers clip off this clip and we'll we'll come back in five years and see your what your take is. Uh, it feels pretty safe, though. Yeah. Like I know usually I would say, well, Will Levis is a major question mark. Anthony yeah. Richardson, major question mark. Both have really high ceilings, but also both have really low floors. She's a Stroud has a higher floor than the other two uh, and a high ceiling as well. But I, I do still have my question marks about some of the things that we discussed being able to process, being able to, to get in and out of plays, make adjustments, fix protections, all those other things. I just think the offense and the way the offense translates from college to pro, there might be a little bit more of a learning curve there than for Bryce. So uh, I think it's pretty easy to narrow it down to two, but if you had to kind of pick between Stroud and, and Bryce, uh, I would lean towards Bryce just a little bit. Uh, Bryce Young is the, excuse me, third Alabama QB drafted in the first round over the last four years. Uh, Of course, you have Mac Jones and two of there. Um, Who do you believe is the next QB up for the Tide? Well, it's difficult right now because it's a three-headed monster that's competing for the position. Uh, You have Jalen Milrow, who, for those that are watching that are NFL fans, his skill set is very similar to that of a really young Jalen Hurts where maybe just a little bit inconsistent throwing the football, but as a dynamo when you get the ball in his hands. However, he's a third-year player. Jalen Hurts started as a true freshman, so you would think that his passing development would have improved significantly from the time he got on campus to where he's at now. That step hasn't really happened yet, but he's dynamic with the ball in his hands. You move next to Ty Simpson, better athlete than you might think, uh, but good thrower, accurate thrower, probably in line with a at this stage of his career a Ryan Tannehill where he's going to be solid he's going to lean on the run game he's going to lean on the people around him can be a difference maker if given the opportunity but probably not going to be a complete game changer at this stage of his development he's a redshirt freshman and then the other guy that recently entered the mix is Tyler Buckner Tyler Buckner is transferring down from Notre Dame when he's been on the field there have been some bright moments but there's also been a lot of inconsistencies he's had a handful of interceptions his touchdown interception ratio in short order has not been very good and he's been injury prone he had a knee injury in high school he also had a shoulder injury this past year has had an ankle injury in the past and in addition to those injuries he missed his entire senior year of high school due to COVID because he's from California and they shut down high school sports that year so he just hasn't played a lot of football so he's got natural ability he's really talented he's just really raw and the decision making process isn't quite where it needs to be just yet so it's going to be interesting to kind of see how they divvy up the reps from this point forward to see ultimately who takes the starting job for the tide, but it's anybody's guess as to right now. And even someone with their finger on the pulse and someone with a lot of contacts in Tuscaloosa, nobody can clearly tell you exactly who that guy's going to be. Uh, Nick Saban, 
obviously a lot of success there in Alabama. His uh, SEC rival and former assistant, uh, Kirby Smart, and his Georgia Bulldogs, they won back-to-back -back national championships. Do you believe, Greg, that Alabama's done enough to get back on top this coming season? Yeah, I mean, it's the thing is the margins between all these teams are so razor thin. Uh, Georgia has won back-to-back -back national championships, but Bama was in the national championship two years ago. And John, Jamison Williams tears his ACL in the game. And a lot of people feel if he stays healthy, maybe the outcome's different. I don't like to necessarily look back and say, you know, ifs and buts. It's not, it's not really my, my place. But there is not some Grand Canyon gap between Georgia and Alabama or Alabama and Ohio State. Ohio State actually had a field goal to win it against Georgia last year in the semifinal game. So uh, I think the margins amongst the teams at the top are really, really thin. But I also think at the same time, Georgia last year proved right now that they're kind of in their own world because they lost 15 players at the draft a year ago. A lot of us thinking, man, they got to replace a lot of holes. They replaced nine guys drafted off their defense in and of itself and 15 players overall that were drafted for the dogs in the 2022 draft say, man, they got to take a step back. I mean, they're just not going to be as deep. They're not going to be maybe a top end talent might not be quite as good. And then in many ways here in 22, the season of 22, they were actually better than they were at any point in the 21 season. They went undefeated and ultimately dominated TCU for the national championship. And then they go on to have 10 more guys drafted. So that replaced 25 guys over a two year span is pretty remarkable. And they're the odds on favor right now to win a third national championship. Now, part of that has to do with what their regular season schedule looks like. Believe me, it's gettable. It's extremely gettable, but either way, they've positioned themselves accordingly. And being able to show off that they can lose that many and not skip a beat and in some ways improve tells you that they are right now, uh, you know, playing in their own world. Everyone else is kind of living in it right now. So uh, I think Georgia's really, really good. I think Alabama can absolutely win the national championship this year. I think Ohio State can. I think Michigan can. I think a handful of other teams can too, but uh, the margins are not as significant as I think some people might like to assume. I am not going to take offense to the fact that you didn't mention USC in that mix <laughs> as a former alma mater myself. Um, but yes, I, I always enjoy watching the SEC and how things shake out there because nonetheless, it's a very, very competitive uh, place to play football. And uh, it's, it's always fun to kind of watch for me, my first love is college football. So, Greg, thank you so much for the for the breakdown, how the season may end up shaking out in terms of the NFL and how these uh, rookie QBs may, may play this season. It'll be fun nonetheless, and I appreciate your time. No, it'll be awesome, Aaron. Thank you so much for having me and look forward to visiting again soon.